Welcome to Nona Church. Our mission here is to help as many people as possible know and take their next best step in following Jesus. We know your time is valuable, so we are so grateful that you're joining us for church at home. In fact, if this is your first time with us, we would love for you to grab a coffee on us this week. So go ahead and grab your phone and text Nona Church with no spaces to 94,000 and follow the prompts. We'd love to connect with you and find out how we can help you take your first step this week. We have four children at home and they all love engaging each week with our Nona Kids Church at Home content. There's something for every age group that will connect with your child's heart. You can find this week and past week's content on our Nona Church Facebook or YouTube pages. If you're already part of our Nona Church family, we miss you and we can't wait to be together again soon. Our team would love to connect with you, so be sure to say hi and chat with us in the comments. Would you do me a favor? Would you hit the share button below to help us help others take their next best step in following Jesus today? You never know who might need to hear this message. We're excited as our lead pastor, Colin, wraps up our series, Not What I Expected, Finding God in the Gap. So as we get ready to worship, let's come together and pray. Jesus, Lord, we thank you for this time, our opportunity to come together corporately and worship together. And Father, I pray that you'd be with Colin right now and give him a message that would connect with each of our hearts and help us find you in the gaps that we're experiencing today. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Just one word, and you calm the storm that surrounds me. Just one word, the darkness has to retreat. Just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. Just one touch. My eyes were open to see, my heart can't help but believe. But there's nothing that our God can't do, and there's not a mountain that He can move. A praising name and that makes a way. But there's nothing that our God can't do. It's just one word. You hear what's broken inside. Just one word, and you revive every dream. Oh, it's a miracle, it's a miracle. Just one touch, I feel the power of heaven. Oh, just one touch, my eyes are open to see. My heart can't help but believe. Oh, this is nothing.
There's not a mountain that he can't burn And a brazen day that makes a way There's nothing that a God can't do yeah. There's nothing that a God can't do There's not a prison wall he can't break through And a brazen day that makes a way
Well, good morning, Nona Church family. So glad that you're with us for part four of our series, Not What I Expected. Hey, can we put our hands together and thank Gina Butts? What an incredible job she did last week. In fact, if you're watching right now, throw some heart emojis in the comments. Gina, you did an incredible job and we're so, so grateful for you. And while we're saying thank you, throw some hand clap emojis in uh, the chats and comments as well for our volunteer teams. Right now, while you're watching this online, we've got a number of volunteers that are gathering right now to get ready for in-person gatherings. And we're so, so thankful for you. You know, this series has had a lot of impact and resonance with people. And so Gina and I are actually going to uh, have a podcast uh, where we answer questions about what it means to, to live in the gap, to find God in the gap. And so if you have any questions, feel free to text my next step to 94,000. Let us know what your questions are. You can text the number that's on the screen as well. We're going to release this podcast later on this week. And we're so excited about what it's going to mean for us to continue this discussion and dialogue. If you have your Bibles, uh, meet me in John chapter 11. John chapter 11, that's where we're going to be today. And uh, as you're turning there, I want to ask you this question, all right? Um, Have you ever been in a relationship where you want one thing and then the person that you're in a relationship wants something absolutely different? Have you guys ever been in that situation before? Yes, right? I'm looking at a married couple right here. I know that we've walked through this as well. Uh, It could be a restaurant, right? Moe's or Chipotle. It could be uh, what movie you're going to watch. It could be what vacation you're going to take. Some people like the mountains. Other people like the beach. I've never understood you mountain people. Bring the beach my way, right? And in our relationship with Stacy and I, there's no doubt that there have been moments where Stacy wants something different than what I want. And usually it has to do with the show that we're trying to watch on TV. So, so if I could kind of paint a picture for you, this is the kinds of shows that Stacy Marie Outerbridge loves to watch. She loves to watch slow shows that are very, very slow uh, with British accents that you cannot understand what they're saying. There's a ton of dialogue and you fall asleep within the first five minutes. Like that is the dream date for Stacy. I'm like the direct opposite. I want explosions, I want fast cars, and I want Will Smith. Like that's what makes a good movie or show uh, for me. And so uh, to Stacy's credit, she's really kind. Uh, she lets me every now and then win. Sometimes I get to watch the movie I want to watch, but usually it's five years later on TNT after she's gone to bed. That's usually what happens. TNT knows drama, by the way. So, so as I, as I kind of lean into this conversation that we're having today, I think all of us can probably point to a relationship or a place in our life where uh, we just want something different than what the other person wants. And that's one thing relationally. It's another thing when it comes to our relationship with God. And I might submit to you today that as we kind of enter into this conversation, that the gap between our expectations and our experience exists when what we want in our life is not what God wants. That sometimes there's a gap that, ex- that we experience, right? That, that what I think my life should look like, what I think God should be doing in my day to day, that's not what God wants for me. And when that gap exists, it can do some things to us. You know, we've been talking about it in this series that that, that gap should be filled with faith, but we can fill that gap with a whole lot of other things. Uh, write this down in your notes. The gap can either be where our faith is strengthened or when the bottom falls out. Uh, We know people, right, that have given up on following Jesus because he didn't answer their prayer, because it seems like what they wanted in life was nothing like what they were hoping life to be. People ask this question all the time. Is God there? Does God care? If God was good, why would he allow these things to happen? And that's what we're going to tackle today in John chapter 11. In John chapter 11, we're going to see three individuals, three three groups uh, that see Jesus in a certain way. They want Jesus to do something for them, and he has a different plan. And so if you've got your Bible, go to John chapter 11. We're going to pick it up in verse 1. I'm going to read a lot today, talk a little bit, and that's going to be our flow. And as we read this text, I want you to really pick out for yourself what group you resonate with most, all right? So John chapter 11, verses 1 through 4, this is what it says. Now, a man was sick, Lazarus from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha, Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair, and it was her brother Lazarus who was sick. So the sister sent a message to him, saying, Lord, 
the one who you love. In fact, underline that in your Bible, who you love. Anytime you see the word love, underline it today. The one who you love is sick. When Jesus heard it, he said, this sickness will not end in death, but is for the glory of God. Now, underline the word love whenever you see it and circle that phrase, glory of God. Anytime you see the word glory, go ahead and circle it. When Jesus said this, he said it's for the glory of God so that, pay attention to this, the Son of God may be glorified through it. Okay, so these verses set the stage for what we're talking about today. We know a couple of things. We know that Jesus loves Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. We know that. We know Jesus is far away from where they are. He's not in the same uh, location as they are. And we know that their dear brother is sick. That's what we know so far. And as we continue with the story, I think it's important for us to stop and unpack a word that Jesus uses twice in those first four verses. It's the word glory or the idea of glorified. Now, uh, raise your hand real quick. How many of you heard the word glory before, right? Yeah, right, like you watch a basketball game and it's all glory to God, right? You're at the Grammys, it's all glory to God. Preachers say this all the time. We've gotta live for the glory of God, right? There was even a movie called Glory that had Denzel Washington and Morgan Freeman in it, right? The word glory is everywhere. But what does it mean? Have you ever thought that before? What, what does glory mean? mean? Well, I've heard it illustrated a number of times that there are some words in our language that we can utilize to communicate an idea or a, com uh, or a concept, and we don't need to see it to understand it. I could just use words to describe it. So, so I think I've got a basketball somewhere here. Go ahead and throw me that basketball. Thank you so much. Um, so, so you guys know what a basketball looks like, right? But if you were to close your eyes right now, in fact, you can do this at home if you want to. If you were to close your eyes, and I told you, this is what a basketball looks like. It's, um, it's a sphere that's rubber and or leather. Um, you, you pump air into it. It's uh, larger than a cantaloupe, but it's uh, smaller than a birthing ball. You can tell I've had four kids, right? Uh, it, it's something that bounces up and down, and you take that, that round sphere, and you throw it in a cylinder that's 10 feet up in the air. How many of you can envision a basketball right now? Can you do that, right? Yeah, of course. Good job, good job. All right. So here's what I want you to understand. All right. You don't have to see a basketball to imagine one, but that is not the case with God's glory. John Piper puts it this way. He says that there are some words in our vocabulary that we can communicate with, not because we can say them, but because we see them. We can point. And if we point at enough things and see enough things together and say, that's it, that's it, that's it, that's how we understand glory. So, so write this down in your notes. Glory is best experienced, not explained. Glory is best experienced, not explained. Because our vocabulary is just too limited to fully define it. I think the best stab at a definition comes from Paul Tripp. He says this. In everything that he is and in everything that God does, God is greater than human description. Every attribute and action of God is stunningly beautiful in every way. Each characteristic of God and every accomplishment from his hand is totally perfect. This is what we mean when we talk about God's glory. So pay attention to this. A basketball is conceptual because I can conceive of it in my mind. But glory is referential. I have to see it or have a point of reference to understand what it is. That's why the scriptures say all over the place that the heavens declare the glory of God. To understand glory, you've got to experience glory. And this is why, pay attention, in verse four, Jesus says, this sickness will not end in death, but it is for the glory of God. Meaning he wants to give those that are involved in this story a point of reference that they can look back on to see just how incredible and good God is. Give me a yes if you're tracking with me. Are you tracking with me? Give me a yes in the chats if you're tra tracking with me as well. Good. Now, here's the big idea for today's message, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you write it down, and I want you to say it back to me. Say it back to me as well. Wherever you're watching live or on demand, write this down in your notes. It's your gap is for God's Glory. Go ahead and say that with me. One, two, three. Your gap is for God's glory. 
Now, that's easy to say, but we'll see that that isn't where everyone starts or how everyone affected in the story feels. Remember, Lazarus is sick, and they want Jesus to come and heal their brother. So we pick it up in verse 5 and 6, and what we'll find here as we continue on in the story is that the decisions Jesus makes along the way seemingly get more and more absurd as we go. So pick it up in verse 5. It says this, Now Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Now, I don't know about you, but that seems a little bit confusing to me, right? You would expect the text to say that when Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he got up and went to his friend. Or at the very least, like he had done in previous places, he just spoke a word and healed Lazarus from where he was. But there was a reason behind Jesus' choice that we'll see later on. Now, there are three groups in this story that experience a gap with Jesus that I want us to see today. And I want you to locate yourself as you think about your walk with God. Uh, The first one is this, uh, write this down. It's the direction gap. It's the direction gap. And it asks this question, does God know what he's doing? The direction gap. Does God know what he's doing? Uh, Follow with me in verse seven. It says, then after that, Jesus said to his disciples, let's go to Judea again. So this is two days. Jesus is hanging out and chilling. He turns to his disciples and says, boys, it's time for us to go to Judea. And look at their response in verse eight. Rabbi, the disciples told him, just now the Jews tried to stone you and you're going there again? Essentially, the disciples are saying this, Jesus, are you sure that's the direction we're supposed to go? Uh, Jesus, last time we came from the area you're wanting us to head to, they tried to kill you. You're a wanted man. I'm not sure, Jesus, you know exactly what you're doing. Uh, Let me ask you this. Have you ever had a moment in your life where you have questioned God's direction for you. Has that ever happened to anybody out there? I'm sure it's happened here in the room, right? Uh, For some of us, it's God, why did you take me out of this job? I was really enjoying it. God, why did you make me move to hot, sweaty, suburban Orlando? I don't understand what you're doing. Uh, God, I I wasn't expecting to have a kid and now there's a kid on the way, right? All of us have had this question. God, why are you doing this right now? The disciples are asking the same question. Jesus, why in the world would you want to head back to to Judea? So Jesus responds in verse nine and says, aren't there 12 hours in a day? He's quoting a proverb here. Jesus answered, if anyone walks during the day, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks during the night, he does stumble because the light is not in him. He said this and then he told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm on my way. I'm on my way to wake him up. Here's what Jesus is saying in verse 9 and 10. We don't catch it in a plain reading, but what he's saying here is essentially this. Uh, When I do my work in the day, meaning I'm in the light of what God's called me to do, my safety is secure. Jesus knows that there will be a day, there will be a dark night when he goes to the cross to defeat death for our behalf, to go to the grave. He's going to walk through some really dark times, but right now he's in the season of light. Jesus isn't afraid of what's coming because Jesus knows what's happening. But the disciples respond like you and I would respond. Verse 12, they say this, Lord, if Lazarus has fallen asleep, he will get well, right? In other words, Jesus, he's just napping. We, We don't have to go. Jesus, however, was speaking about his death, verse 13, but they thought he was speaking about natural sleep. So Jesus then told them plainly, Lazarus has died. Could you imagine being Jesus? I'm sure there are days where he's just like, These are the 12 I picked, right? My goodness. And then he tells them, and this is so good, the why behind the reason why they're going. He says this in verse 15. I'm glad for you that I was not there so that you may believe, but let's go to him. In other words, I'm glad that what you're about to see with your own eyes is gonna place belief. It's gonna help you fill the gap with faith in your life. The gap was for God's glory. And then I love how John writes, because we can tell this isn't a fairy tale. This is just real life stuff. Look at verse 16. It says this, sassy, doubting Thomas goes, then Thomas, called twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go too, so that we may die with him. Let me ask you this. 
Is the gap in your walk with God right now about direction? Is it about your disagreement with his direction? Is it, God, I thought we were going somewhere else with this relationship. I thought we were going somewhere else when it came to my work. I thought we were going somewhere else when it came to what my future was going to look like. Um, my dad is in the room, uh, and, and I think this is a question for you, but it's a question for everybody in the room. Um, do you struggle with backseat driving? Does anybody, anybody struggle with backseat driving? Do you struggle with backseat driving? You know what I'm talking about, right? right? It's always like that one person in the car who, as you're driving to a place you've driven over and over again, they're like, oh, are you sure that's the right way? Or we should have got off on that exit, right? Or, or we, we, this could have been five minutes quicker. You should have you took that turn, right? right? How many of us like backseat driving, right? No, no one likes to be the person driving with the backseat driver, right? And I wonder sometimes if we bought into this philosophy uh, that Jesus uh, is our co-pilot, he's backseat driving, and we get to decide when we listen to him or when we don't. And the truth of the good news of God and his sovereignty and reign is that Jesus is not our backseat driver. He's not our co-pilot. He's driving the thing. And when we allow him to lead, that's when we'll see him in his glory. Maybe the gap that you're struggling with today is a gap between God's direction, and your desires. Uh, here's the second one. Go ahead and write it down. It's the gap of affection. So we talked about the disciples. Now we're going to talk about the sisters, Mary and Martha. Um, we're going to pick it up in verse 17, and it says this. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, less than two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them about their brother. Now, I want to encourage you to go back and read this whole section in, in John chapter 11. We don't have time for all of the verses today. But the second gap that many of us are feeling right now is the gap of affection. And it's asking this question, God, do you care? God, do you see my pain? And are you listening and leaning in? I want you to see how Jesus interacts with both Martha and Mary. So, so pay attention to verse 20. Jesus is going to interact with Martha first. And we see this. As soon as Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Verse 21, then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now the next verses here are incredibly powerful. Martha and Jesus have an interaction. She realizes he is not just a man who can call on God, but he is God, the savior of the world, the resurrection and the life. It's powerful and it's beautiful. And it allows her to actually fill the gap of her doubt with faith because of the truth she comes to believe. But it doesn't change the fact that her brother is still buried. And so while Martha might have seen Jesus in one way, Mary does not say those words at all. We get to verse 32 and we find this, that as soon as Mary came to where Jesus was, he had called for her and saw him, she fell at his feet and told him, Lord, look again, the same phrase, right? If you had been here, my brother would not have died. You see, Mary and Martha have simultaneous disappointment and faith. Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would be alive. Disappointment that Jesus didn't come. Faith that he could have done something about it. Tony Evans commenting on this uh, says this. He says that Mary and Martha are essentially saying to Jesus, this is all your fault, Jesus. I called you, but you didn't come. If you had listened or if you had cared, this wouldn't have happened. Talk about real life, right? I mean, how many of us have, have had these same kind of emotional interactions with God? God, where were you when I needed you? If you really cared, you'd have been here. You would have done something about the situation. I don't know about you, but every now and then it can feel like God leaves us on red, right? He's, we sent the text message, but he's not responding. His voice mailbox inbox is full, right? There, there are moments when it's like, God, are you listening? Are you hearing or are you seeing? Maybe you're in that season right now where it feels like God isn't listening. I want to ask you this question. Is the gap right now that you're feeling with God about his affection? God, I don't, I don't feel loved by you. God, I, I don't feel like you're listening. Well, there is good news if that's the situation you find yourself in. Look at with me to verse 33. Go there. It says this. When Jesus, look at this, underline it, circle it, highlight it, saw her crying and the Jews who had come with her crying he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Where have you put him, he asked. Lord, they told him, come and see. 
And then verse 35, two of the most powerful words in all of Scripture, Jesus wept. Look at me. Jesus cares. He is moved by what moves you. His heart is a heart of compassion. The Father is tender. He's okay with us running to him with simultaneous disappointment and faith. He's big enough for all of it. And we know that because in verse 22, Mary says, or Martha says rather, yet even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. So write this down in your notes. Our gap will glorify God if we live a yet life. God, I don't get what you're doing, yet even now I'm gonna trust you. God, I wanted the relationship to look a certain way and it didn't work out, yet even now I'm gonna believe it's for my good. God, I do not like the diagnosis and what I'm carrying right now, yet even now I believe that you're my healer even if the doctor says something different. There's something about that yet faith that Martha had that changes the game. And I love how one of our elders says this so often. He says this, when you can't see God's hand, trust God's heart. You know, as I, I think about Mary and Martha and the disciples, the disciples, they disagreed with the direction. Mary and Martha, they didn't understand his affection. But for some of us, it's something different that we're struggling with in the gap. It's what I think the, the crowd felt on this particular day. It was the gap that was in their hearts. Write this down. It's the gap of intention. Um, the gap of intention asked this question. Does God want good for me, really? What are his intentions? Verse 36 and 37 say this. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. Verse 37, but some of them said, couldn't he who opened the blind man's eyes also have kept this man from dying? I find it so interesting that the crowd is most likely here referring to an incident in John 9, just a couple of chapters earlier, where Jesus heals a blind man from birth. And they're saying, listen, we heard that this guy could heal people. Uh, Lazarus is a man that he loves. Why would Jesus heal a blind man he didn't know and let his best friend or close friend Lazarus die? It makes no sense, right? What are his intentions? You ever ask that, God, do you really want good for me? I remember when uh, Stacey and I started dating, um, a little bit along the way, I had a conversation with her dad. And he asked me this question. He said, now son, what are your intentions in dating my daughter? And what he was asking me was, do you and I see eye to eye about how she ought to be treated and how life ought to go for her? And I wonder sometimes if we kind of act like life is our little baby, our little child, and God is the one coming to date it. And we say, now, now God, what are your intentions with this? Because I know what I have. I know the plans I've got for my life. Do your plans line up with my plans? And that's where we get some friction. You know, I think it's interesting. Um, we ask things like, why did God answer their prayer, but not mine? God, what are your intentions? Why did they get the promotion and I didn't? God, what are your intentions? Why is it that I've been working so hard to, to move forward in life and the person that hurt me the most is still getting more success and favor than I am? God, what are your intentions? And I think it's interesting that the crowd made a mistake that many of us make. Write this down. The crowd came to a conclusion about Jesus's intentions based upon limited information. It's very dangerous for us as followers of Jesus or for skeptics who are not sure about this Christianity thing to come to a conclusion about the heart of God with limited information about the nature and character of God. You see, in this moment, the crowd was looking for healing. They thought the goal was healing, but Jesus had a different purpose in mind. He wasn't going for healing. He was going for glory, all right? Find this in verse 38. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb, and it, it was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Remove the stone, Jesus said. Now pay attention to Martha. Martha, who is human like us, who's uh, upset with Jesus and then has faith and then kind of loses faith in this next verse. Look what she says. She says, Lord, there's already a stench because he has been dead four days. Martha does not see a resurrection coming. Martha's still confused by the choices that Jesus 
is making. Isn't that good news for us that have been followers of Jesus for a long time? That there are going to be times when we get it right and times when we're going to get it wrong and it could be in the same exact moment? Yeah. You know, I think about this. Martha didn't understand the power of her words that John would get to document for us to read. Because in that moment, she's not seeing how they would impact us. You see, in Jewish culture during that day, it was a common kind of cultural norm that people believed that the soul of a person would hover over the body for three days trying to get back in. So a person wasn't actually pronounced dead until the fourth day. So work this timeline with me, okay? A messenger goes to Jesus on day one and says that Lazarus is sick. Jesus says, this is not a sickness that's going to end in death, right? But then Lazarus dies. Most people believe it was the day that the, the messenger went that Lazarus died. Jesus stays two days in the city where he's at and doesn't go to Lazarus and then arrives on the fourth day. So everyone believes he is dead. It is game over. The story is written. What seemed unintentional by Jesus staying for two days was deeply intentional. And this is what he says in verse 40. Jesus said to Martha, didn't I tell you that if you believed, look at this, you would see, now say the next word with me, the glory of God. Say that again, the glory of God. Remember, Glory is meant to be seen and experienced, not simply explained. Verse 41, so they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I know that you are always here with me. But because of the crowd standing here, I say this, so that they may believe you sent me. So Jesus is performing this sign, this miracle for all three, the disciples who are there. Martha and Mary, who need an injection of new faith and an understanding of God's glory, and the crowds who are not sure what to make of Jesus. And he says in verse 43, after this, he said, shouting with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out bound hand and foot with linen strips and with his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unwrap him and let him go. And then pay attention to verse 45. Your Bible ends there, but pay attention to verse 45. Okay, it says this. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he did believed in him. Now catch this, okay? This is, this is the, the marvelous, beautiful hand of a sovereign God, a, a, a savior who it sees 50 steps ahead, one who's playing chess while we're playing checkers, right? Jesus knew that it wasn't about a healing. Jesus knew it was about his glory, right? So what they were looking for was Jesus to heal Lazarus, which he could have done from afar. He could have never left the town that he was in and simply said, be healed. But Jesus used the pain as a platform to display to more people how good and glorious he is. So when we ask the question, does God want good for me? I would say no. God doesn't want good for you. God wants his glory displayed in you. God doesn't just want good for you. God wants his glory displayed in you. And listen, there are gonna be times in life where what you want is not what's gonna glorify God most. What we need to see is that God's glory is the most important thing that we'll need. They wanted a healing. Jesus wanted a resurrection. And Jesus, pay attention to this, did not meet their expectations. He exceeded them because, go back to the first couple of verses, he loved them. That's the heart of your God. That's the heart of your Father in heaven. And in the middle of your gap, he is doing what is best for you. And what is best for you is for his glory to be displayed in you. Too many of us want God to answer the prayer and the prayer ought to be, God, do what's best for your glory because if it's for your glory, it's gonna be for my good. So let me ask you this question. Where do you find yourself in the story? Do you find yourself like the disciples questioning God's direction? God, do you know what you're doing? Do you find yourself like Mary and Martha questioning God's affection? God, do you really care? 
Do you find yourself like the crowd questioning God's intentions right now? God, do you really want good for me? Because here's what I know, is that you and I can allow the gap to stop us from seeing God's glory, or we can allow the gap to actually be the pathway to seeing and experience his goodness in real time. So let me ask you this question as we close. What if God wants to use your gap for his glory? What if your singleness is how God wants to demonstrate his glory to a world who's wondering what it looks like to be whole with Christ and Christ alone? What if the job that you've lost is an opportunity for you to trust God as a person who continues to give faithfully and teach your kids that God is still worthy of our best? What does it look like when the diagnosis comes in and you don't know what to do with it to trust that God has a plan and he's not gonna waste one ounce of the chemo. He's not gonna waste one ounce of the doctor's visits or the bills that we've gotta pay. God has a purpose and a plan. What if your, your marriage is on the rocks right now and culture's telling you to walk away and God wants to glorify himself by your faithfulness to your spouse in this season? What if? What if God wants to use your gap for his glory? You know, I think it's time for us to stop asking the question, why me, God? And start asking the question, God, what do you want me to do for your glory? For some of us, that's what we need to do today. We need to stop asking, why me, God? And we need to start asking, how can I use this gap for your glory. Because here's what I know, why me will kill your faith. How can I use this for your glory? We'll build it. You know, maybe you've been listening to this message and you'd say, man, I, I don't know who I resonate with. In fact, the person I resonate with most is actually Lazarus. <laughs> I'm dead. I've got nothing to give. I've actually considered whether or not life is even worth living at this point. I feel like I'm in the deep, dark tomb of despair. I wanna invite you to know that Jesus has a word for you too. It's the word that he gave to Lazarus. Come out and come forth. Jesus's invitation to you right now is life because Jesus went on a cross and then he ended up in a tomb too so that he could one day defeat death, which he did three days later, raising himself from the dead, proving he is the resurrection and the life so that all of us can know that his glory is for our good. And when we're in his story, he'll work things together so that one day, even if it's not on this side of eternity, we'll know the purpose and the reason. So maybe as you're watching this right now, you've not started a relationship with Jesus. I wanna encourage you to do that. His word to you today is come forth. Come forth. Because there's a story he wants to write in your life too. Would you join me as we pray? Heavenly Father, I pray that this word would fall um, in exactly the way you want it to fall. That God, people's lives would be changed, hearts would be transformed, and we would recognize that our gap can be leveraged for your glory. And that God, your glory is actually for our good. That God, you are a God of great intention. You know where you're going. We can trust you with the direction. You love us deeply. We can trust you with our affection. And God, you are a God of intention. You do nothing by accident. All of it you're in control of, including our life. So Father, it may not be what we expected, but Father, would you show us that what you have actually exceeds what we've expected. And it's all because of Jesus. Amen and amen. Thank you for joining us online today for Church at Home. We hope you've been able to connect with God and with one another. Before you go, here are a couple of things you're gonna want to know heading into the week. We've been able to make an impact in our community and create opportunities for people to know and take their next best step in following Jesus because so many of you are generous with your time and your finances. If Nona Church is your home, and you've yet to start giving your tithe online, you can easily and securely give through Planning Center by visiting nonachurch.com give or by texting any amount to 84321 to set up your giving. If you'd like to take your next best step in following Jesus, whether by staying connected with us, checking us out in person, or talking to someone about starting a relationship with Jesus, all you need to do is just text 
My Next Step with No Spaces to 94,000, and we'll be sure to follow up with you this week. And now, as we close our time together, would you stand with me, and if you're comfortable, simply extend your hands in the posture of receiving the good that God has prepared for us. Receive this benediction, this blessing from the Lord that we find in Colossians 3.15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. This week, go with God and walk in the way of Jesus.